the town of Farmington. Respecting history, planning the future. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, the second in our series of uh, three presentation meetings. Again, thank you for taking some time out tonight to join us. Hopefully, the accommodations are a little more comfortable this evening. If you attended last time, we made some adjustments. Uh, in addition, I do want to remind everybody we do have Nutmeg TV here as well uh, that's recording our meeting tonight. So that will be available uh, up online shortly for people to view, um, probably in a few days or so. And also remember that the presentation material that you're going to see tonight will be go up, up on the website as soon as possible um, once we've, we've seen all those presentations. So something to keep in mind as we move forward. Uh, the first order of business tonight that I want to talk about is, is actually included in my chair report, part of the agenda. And now that we're, we're moving through this process of um, really looking at the different phases of this project that the building committee has been charged with. I wanted to do just a quick, take maybe five to 10 minutes, do a quick kind of level set and context of the project overall to give everybody an idea of where we are in the process, some very high level dates to keep in mind and, and take that information as we move forward through the presentations tonight. So the slides you see again will be available for review <coughs> after the meeting. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about is just kind of a very high level review of the timeline. So the very first thing you see up there is really the step that we're in right now, which is conceptual option phase. And this is where we're talking about the maintain, the renovate, and the new conceptual options. We're going to talk a little bit more in detail about what a conceptual option is in a minute on a different slide, but something to keep in mind. And during this part of the phase, or part of the project, we're looking at this is a really great opportunity for us to get community feedback and priorities from everybody here as well as community meetings and any opportunity online, any information, feedback, thoughts, comments you can give us. It's a great time for, for everybody to be involved and engaged in the project at this point. So once, as we're moving through this conceptual option phase, we're gonna actually end up, I feel like I need to point to it, but my, my mic doesn't move. The, um, we're actually, the, the result of that is us going to town council, the, the building committee going to town council with a recommended option. So you've heard us talk about that multiple times, and most likely that information is gonna come out to everybody in the January 29th meeting of the building committee where we'll have a full evaluation of all the options and come forward with a recommendation based on everything we've heard. Once we have that decided as a building committee, our step is to go to the town council at that point Right now that's scheduled for February 4th, a town council meeting, where town council will set a net municipal project cost range. So that's a word that you'll hear people talk about. So on all the information that they've received, they're gonna take that and do additional analysis on that information based on a recommendation to set that project cost range based on a lot of factors. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that in a little bit. Kat's actually gonna get up and talk about a little bit more about that role of town council and um, give you some more information, as well as that project scope. And that's really what option are we going to go with moving forward. So that's, that's really a big step in this process. After that's done, town council will recharge us as a building committee to move forward with the option selected into what's called schematic design. So at that point, one architect will be chosen, a general option or a conceptual option will be chosen, and then we go into a process that really is the detailed design work around that schematic design, which will get us closer to a, an actual dollar amount for the entire project, which is what you'll see in step four, which is that's actually when we go to the town meeting and go to referendum with that dollar amount on the ballot. And that's right now scheduled for October of 2020. So that at its, its highest level, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. There's been stuff that's work that's been done before this, but this is kind of where we are in the process right now. So when we talk about this conceptual option phase, these are some of the steps that I was talking about. So what's been done so far is we've obviously selected professional partners, people you see here tonight, um, as far as our owner's rep and CSG and our two architects that you're gonna hear speak in a minute. That was a big part of our process, make sure we have the expertise we need as a town and as a building committee to make really smart decisions and gather the right information moving forward. 
So at this point, we've also worked with those architects to create conceptual options. Um, and before that, actually, I skipped a step, is our job as the committee was to come up with evaluation criteria. So once we have these options in front of us, how best do we evaluate those options? There's six options being presented. How do we actually look at those in a way that makes sense and that we can actually see what benefits are associated to each and what does that mean to us? So by taking that evaluation criteria that you'll see us use, it's a, there's a big sheet right on our tables there. Michael, if you want to hold it up. That's actually what we're using as we're hearing the presentations. And we're using that criteria to evaluate the, the options that we see tonight. So again, we're doing the maintain, the renovate, and the new options. And then um, after our options are presented, again, as I talked about, we're going to make that recommendation uh, to town council. And then town council sets the net municipal project cost range and project scope. So just a little more detail around the conceptual, uh, the, the conceptual option phase of the project and what that means. So far, so good? OK. So what I wanted to talk about, too, again, to level set, is really what a conceptual design option is. So at the very highest level, that, that top statement, I think, really does help put some context around it. And the primary function of this conceptual design is to, deter to determine a starting point. So you won't hear every detail that you want to hear about every option tonight. And we know that generates questions. And all those questions, please let us know as you hear them. Send us emails, do whatever you want to do to get that information to us, and we'll try our best to, to answer those to the best of our ability. But again, remember, these are conceptual options at the highest level to give us enough information to move forward. So again, very high-level design concepts. We categorize, categorize them as either a maintain, renovate, or new building option. Uh, the focus is really on meeting the statement of needs, which is out there on the website for everybody to read. You might have seen that one pager that, that's gone around that's really a summary of um, the, that's the summary of needs that is a much larger statement of needs that, that uh, has come out of the Board of Ed and has been approved there and come to us as far as what are really the requirements for the project that, that we're trying to meet those needs. And from there, this is kind of two important parts again that you're going to hear more about, uh, more about, but high level cost using an independent estimator. So you do hear CSG come up here and give financial information through an independent estimator. So. As the process, when we talked through it last time, the architects give all that information to CSG and the estimator that they have assigned, and an independent estimate is brought forward to us. So that's really a good tool for us to use to make sure that we're getting evaluation from all different angles on this and looking at all the information accordingly. And another point that I do want to mention here is, is estimated um, tax impact. So when we present that financial information that CSG is going to give tonight, there'll be a line item that gives you kind of an estimate of what the tax impact will be. So just know, again, always refer back to the fact that this is a conceptual option, high level, and that basic financing methods and it's a point and using point in time data is used for that estimate. So again, Kat's going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but just keep that in mind. So we know that there's more information everybody wants to know about financing and the tax impact, and that will come. Don't, I don't want anybody to feel that it's not. We are doing that work. We're, we are aligned with town council. We are aligned with the town. And that, that stuff is all in process. But in, as far as the, where we are in the overall process, that's why that number looks the way it does right now. Yes? All right. OK, so that's kind of just a high level overview. Keep that in mind as we move forward through the, the um, conceptual options for the renovate. Uh, uh, renovation of the facility tonight, just to keep everything in context. Okay? All right, so um, <coughs> next order of business is public comment. Before we get to that, I just want to mention, too, that you might have seen online, January 25th, there is a community meeting scheduled, so another opportunity to see the options, uh, all of the options presented in one spot. Uh, they'll, it'll be right here in the high school, as well, it, it runs from 9 to 12, on Saturday, January 25th. And it's one of those things, it's a drop-in event. If you have time that morning, please stop by. You, the architects will be there. Representation from the architectural firms will be there. Ask questions, review them. And then we are also offering tours of the high school on the hour during that morning. So if you haven't had an opportunity to do a tour, especially this tour, a lot of great information provided by students as they walk you around the building. So maybe even if you've done the tour before, 
try this one again. Ask people who actually went to the community meeting before. We got a lot of great feedback. So please try to work that into your schedule if you can. And again, one more time, all the options and the information you see tonight presented will be on the website as soon as we can get it up there. All right. So I'm going to open it up for public comment. One thing I do want to mention is we have some conflicting events tonight. So if uh, concerts and other things that are happening within the district, so if we could just kind of give people who have, I know Rafina, you need to come up and speak. So if we can kind of give people the opportunity to come up if they do have to leave um, to speak, that would be great. Um, but please feel free and, to come up and give comment. As she mentioned, I'll be running out of here in about five minutes after I speak. Hopefully there are no police officers mm -hmm. on the road. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you. Let me do that. My name is Rafina Lee. I live at 3 Hamilton Way. I am here to represent a group called Comprehensive FHS. We are a nonpartisan organization. Can you guys hear me OK? Made up of town residents. Our mission is to advocate for and support a comprehensive solution to all of the issues <coughs> at Farmington High School. As Meg mentioned, this phase of the process is just high-level con conceptual designs. However, <coughs> to maintain only options that we heard of last week are not a comprehensive solution, nor were they intended to be. However, the two maintain only options only solve but a really tiny, tiny part of the larger problem. Uh, the two presentations that we saw, Q, A, and M's, while really aesthetically pleasing and very flashy, is not a maintain-only option. It was a renovation light option. It's TK, I'm sorry, TSKP's presentation was the sole maintain option that we saw last week. And it would basically keep a falling building afloat for maybe another five to ten years, maybe, without addressing any of the issues. No sprawl, the outdated mechanicals, None of the aging roof, well, a part of it would be taken um, and take care, taken care of. None of the science classrooms that we need and none of the air conditioning throughout the whole building. And at $50 million, almost $50 million, that seems really financially irresponsible for our town to even consider. So we urge the building committee, we urge town council to really look at all of the options and choose the design that would really address all of the needs, a comprehensive plan, so that we're not here again in five, 10, or even 15 years. We look forward to hearing tonight's presentations and next week's presentations as well. And if you're interested in joining our group, my um, colleague Matt is somewhere, and he'll be passing around a sign-up sheet for your email addresses. Uh, we will be providing newsletters as we go forward through this process, and we hope that the town and town residents will continue to be as engaged as we have been so far. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, I'm Emily Kalini. I live at 30 High Street. Um, first of all, thank you to the committee because I know there's a lot of people in the room right now, but you guys have had a lot of meetings and there have not usually been a lot of people in the room. So um, I know you've put in a lot of time, so thank you. I was here last week, um, and I see a lot of faces who were here last week too. And I think it was a really important exercise to do the um, maintain only options. I think that those numbers are numbers that the town um, and its residents have been curious about and asking about what would it cost just to maintain. And so I think at least um, the, the smaller of the two options uh, answers that question for us. And I also think it's um, clear to many of people who listen to the presentation that maintaining only is not uh, the choice that makes the most sense for our town, that spending that much money, um, again, between 40 and $50 million, to not solve sprawl and to not fix the security problems and to um, not fully abate the hazmat risks in the building, I mean, them telling us, just put carpet on top of the carpet, don't lift underneath. Um, it doesn't seem like that's the solution we want for our town and that we've been working on now for years. Um, I also think that the committee and the groups that are working to publicize the information have to be really careful because that low number is out there now and it's already been um, 
heard on soccer sidelines and other places in town informally saying, hey, they did it. Did you hear? There's a cheap one. It's going to be fine. So that is happening. That's already happening. So I think it's really important for the town and the committee to make sure that the people who um, are kind of taking that five second look instead of coming to these long meetings, that those facts are out there because those of us who sat there, we know, no, there's not air conditioning in the whole building and that's what's already being said. And no, it's not all fixed for that amount of money. So um, I think we just have to be careful that we have that, in, that number and now we you know, make sure we use it um, to the right uh, advantage for the town as a whole so that we really truly do solve the problems that we're, we're here sitting here trying to solve. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Hutt-Fagner. I live at 4 Deepwood Road. Uh, I'm also a member of uh, Comprehensive FHS, and I believe a comprehensive solution is necessary for this building project. <clears throat> a comprehensive solution is necessary for the educational standards expected by this community. A comprehensive solution is a necessary investment for our community. I do not believe the maintain options presented last week achieve a comprehensive solution. The maintain options do not address building sprawl. They do not dr address security issues. The maintained options do not address educational programming, including the overcrowded class sizes. <clears throat> uh, if you agree a comprehensive solution is necessary for FHS, I encourage you to sign up with Comprehensive FHS. I have some, uh, some clipboards here, which I'll pass out shortly. If you feel like your voice needs to be heard, please sign up. <coughs> if you feel upset about the current state of the facilities, please sign up. If you feel upset, uh, um, excuse me, if you want our elected leaders to pick a comprehensive solution to bring to referendum, please sign up. The voting members of the building committee will recommend, <clears throat> and ultimately, the members of the town council will decide what options we get to vote on. We need to make sure they hear from members of the community. I'm, I'm, I know this may come across as hokey, but to end with the often used quote, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, that's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Hello, I'm Megan Naljox at Five Trumbo Lane. Um, while I appreciate the work that was put into the presentations last week, I don't believe that they're the right options for our community. This town cannot afford another Band-Aid solution. Spending $99 million for an option that already doesn't meet the specifications and adds another addition, you can't hear me? I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this town cannot afford another Band-Aid solution. Spending $99 million for an option that doesn't meet all the specifications and adds an addition to an already sprawling building is not the way forward nor is pumping another $49 million into a building to barely keep it alive. These options are incredibly disruptive to learning and they will affect the community at large when shared spaces like the gym and the auditorium are closed for lengthy periods of time. I believe choosing to maintain this facility would be a disservice to our students, to our educators, and to taxpayers now and especially in the future. We need a more comprehensive solution that only, not only meets all of the education specifications, but also can serve a community for decades to come. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jill Pakla at 27 Reservoir Road. I also represent Comprehensive FHS. And I wanted to uh, exemplify that that is a nonpartisan group. So that is not just a uh, Democrat or Republican. We rep represent everyone. And I agree with Matt that the information really needs to get out there. When I talk to just my friends that you would think would know, other mothers, they still don't understand what truly is going on here at the school. When I walked in here, uh, a mother of a student said, what's going on in the library tonight? And I explained it, and she said, oh yeah, I've been hearing some things about that. 
We've been doing a lot on social media, but I don't think we're even impacting 10% of the town from what we do. And we really need to get the word out there, not just on social media, but so everyone understands what they're voting for when the time comes. So thank you to the building committee, and I hope you do sign up for comprehensive FHS. Hello, my name is uh, Steve Lamour. I live at 86 Knollwood Road, so right in the neighborhood of the high school. Um, you know, what I do for work is I'm a healthcare provider. So what I do a lot of the time is maintain health for people. Um, so I talk, you know, I was talking to some friends and people um, and just my colleagues about just kind of this situation. And when you maintain, normally it's a good thing. You're maintaining blood pressure, you're maintaining cholesterol levels, you're maintaining a health of a person. So I relate that my perspective to this building. And we've maintained it for so long. We've put band-aids, we've done cardiac casts on this building, we've added this, we've done a bypass, we've added this on. So at some point, the sprawl of a building, the sprawl of the human body can't take it anymore. Um, so I believe that's where we're at with this building. And at some point, it's a difficult decision to make, especially as a town, when we look at these large numbers of what it's gonna to take to replace this building, to renovate it uh, considerably. Um, you know, I think it's clear to everyone, like everybody said, maintain is not the option anymore. This is a sick building for many different reasons. Everything's been kind of put in place. Um, you know, falling roof, leaky roof. You know, if you kind of relate that to the human body, I think it's time to kind of say goodbye to this building. It's, you know, it's a tough decision to do, just as in life. It's tough to say goodbye to somebody that we've known in town for a long time. And uh, I think that's kind of where we're at. We have to kind of go, it's okay to let go. Um, yes, it's gonna cost a pretty penny to do that. But we can do it responsibly by looking at the different options and saying, do we at least meet all of these things that the NIAS wants us to? Because, you know, I'm not in this building every day, but their students are. You know, my daughter's 11, she will be in here. Um, so when we think of pushing the can down the road a lot of times, it's easy to do that because maybe your kids are out of school. You know, you might be on a fixed income. So when we talk about, oh, $400 added on to my tax bill, or whatever that figure is going to be, it's a considerable amount of money that we have to do think about. You know, I don't wanna pay taxes just like anybody else, but I know I live in town, it's my civic duty to do that, because I don't know how long I'm gonna be living in town, but it's for the betterment of society, the betterment of our town. Um, so I look at it that way, so I implore the voting members here, uh, they're gonna vote on this eventually in town, to think of it in that regard of the health of this building and maybe it's time to say goodbye. Thank you. Any other public comment at this time? Please, we do have another opportunity after the presentations as well, so. Next order of business for us is to approve uh, the minutes from the last meeting. So can I get a motion to approve the attached January 8th, 2020 minutes? Oh, second. second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? All right, unanimously approved. Next order of business is correspondence, and uh, we do have a report in here as well. Um, included in our agenda packets, we have some additional correspondence that was received uh, via the website. So um, we have a, me uh, a message from Jay Tulin regarding the Friends Program uh, that's included in our packets. Uh, Megan Naujox, who, so, who you also heard speak tonight, uh, had some questions around finance, financing options as well as Josh Davidson for financing options. And we're gonna hear about that in a minute from Kat. Uh, Stacy Petrozella comments from the 1-8-2020 meeting are included. 
Um, also included is a, a letter from um, our high school principal, Scott Hurwitz, um, regarding a, a donation that we did receive, which was very kind um, to the building committee and a, a response letter uh, in regards to that, just to say thank you, uh, a heartfelt thank you around that. Uh, Stephen Kay uh, comments around classrooms in general and Sarah Burns feedback on the maintain options. So we have all those here and um, if we haven't responded yet, we are working and in the process of responding back uh, to all comments as appropriate. Uh, so as far as reports are concerned, I'm actually gonna turn the microphone over to Kat who's gonna give us a little bit more information around uh, financing. So when determining when, how much, and the duration of any long-term debt the town issues, overriding consideration is given to the following. Preserving the financial integrity of the town, minimizing the impact on town taxpayers, minimizing the impact on the operating budget, budget and on services, and adhering to federal, state, and local legal requirements. The following are some of the criteria used when preparing a debt issue. Industry best standards and practices, town financial policies, current market conditions, cash flow needs for individual capital projects currently being undertaken, as well as overall town cash flow needs, the town's debt service requirements at the ta time of issuance, state and federal legal requirements, and federal tax restrictions. All debt is issued using the town's adopted debt management policy. After debt is issued, it is continuously monitored to determine whether it would be feasible to refinance it in the future. Per the town charter, the Farmington Town Council is the ultimate fiscal authority for the town. Therefore, it is the role of the town council to provide financial policy direction to the town manager and director of finance. The building committee's responsibility is to recommend to the town council a building project option that best meets the needs of the town of Farmington and its students both now and for the foreseeable future. Tonight, the projected tax impact of the standalone options will be presented. However, the town council will ultimately determine the cost parameters of the project when a final option is selected. At that time, the communications subcommittee will be tasked with putting context around the cost of the project and what that means to the taxpayer. The Town of Farmington, through its financial policies, Town Council leadership, and financial management, has a successful history of issuing and managing its debt obligations as proven by its high bond rating, strong financial position, and low taxes. Okay, thanks, Kat. Okay, a uh, next order of business is actually presentations. So this is the, the main event for tonight. Um, the, uh, the format will go uh, exactly how it did last time. So this is 35 minute presentations by each architect, about a five to 10 minute financial uh, presentation after that by CSG, and then a 10 minute question and answer opportunity following uh, each presentation. So um, our first presentation tonight will come from TSKP. And if they are ready, I will turn the floor over to them. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is Richard Zipek, for the record. I'm a partner and an architect with TSKP Studio. Uh, this evening, the presentation will be done mostly by Tai Su Kim, my partner, and me. Um, but we have other people here who are available for questions and answers later, including Michael Scott, who is walking around handing a paper copy of our PowerPoint presentation to the members of the committee. We also have two representatives from our consulting mechanical engineers, Kola Ronan, uh, which include Joe Lembo and Craig Raza. You may recall Joe from previous um, meetings. And then from our site civil landscape consultant, Darren Overton from Milone and McBroom. So um, I've divided this presentation into three parts. The first part is I will make a few introductory comments for the benefit of the public, explain where we are. And then the second part will be a presentation by Tai Su Kim, 
most of our presentation will be focusing on the design and walking through that. We want to make sure you understand what this design entails. And the third part will be a wrap-up by me, and I will go through your evaluation criteria just like I did last time and give you my opinion about how this solution addresses your evaluation criteria. Um, before we get started, I do want to say that working with Taisu as I have for many, many years is a very satisfying experience. He's a very talented designer, and his focus is on making sure that the project is architecturally integrated. It's very easy to get distracted by a lot of factors, and there are a lot of factors in this project, but he keeps his, he keeps his eye on the architectural ball to make sure that we don't end up with an ugly building. So there are a lot of people who have involved, members of the committee, uh, members of the public, including consultants that you see on the, this list. And again, last week we did explain option one. You saw our opinion about a $49.9 million option one. Tonight we'll present option two, and, uh, and then next week option three. Now this diagram or this chart illustrates what we heard from the State Department of Education when they made a presentation here before the public, and they said, look, option two, which is a renovate as new option, which could include additions, you could be eligible for 30 cents per eligible construction dollars or project dollars. We can talk later about, about what eligible dollars are. But the new scenario, option three, you are eligible for 20 cents per eligible project dollar. Why? Well, because the state said a number of years ago, we want to encourage renovation projects. We want to discourage new projects. So that's why there's an incentive for renovation over new. That becomes a factor in the net dollars to the town. Okay, so how much should we renovate in a renovate as new option? Well, we looked at all of the facilities that you have, and one possibility is we look at the age of the buildings, and we focus on updating the older portions of the building, and we save the newer portions of the building. That certainly is one strategy. Uh, another strategy might be well, let's look at what is salvageable, what elements in the existing building can be reused. For instance, you have an auditorium, you have a gymnasium, you have those kinds of spaces that certainly could be repurposed and continue as those kinds of spaces. Where you, I think, fall short is in the academic spaces, the classroom spaces, that probably needs to be either completely replaced or completely renovated. And so maybe if we look at the newer portions and trying to repurpose those as classrooms of the future, maybe we should get rid of the older classroom areas. And that might go a long way to uh, reducing sprawl. So if you total up all of that renovated area, you can see that figure shows uh, approximately 143,950 square feet. We think we can salvage and, re and renovate. So that means that we can renovate approximately 66% of your existing footprint. Great, that means we qualify for the renovate as new option according to the state rules. <clears throat> so what strategy should we take to continue to eliminate the sprawl? Right now you have this circuitous path through the building, getting from one end to the another, it's very confusing. If we can do anything we can to straighten out that path, that would help a lot. So our strategy will be to build some new additions renovate the existing building, and we believe a total of 267,000 gross square feet should do it. That should satisfy your program and deliver the project that you need. So at this point, what I would like to do is Taisu to continue the design discussion. Good evening, a uh, very large turnout. <laughs> But I'm going to show you uh, option to concept design. I'm just talking to a building committee uh, member. I, I know you have scoring sheet, right, for design. Mm -hmm. But I would like to ask you to uh, uh, pay attention to this uh, uh, five important issues I consider as a designer. So. I agree to hope, follow this sequence to explaining our design, okay? 
So five, I can't really see very well. Okay. Okay, five uh, important is design issues are sequence of construction and site improvement and plan organization and meeting the educational specification and uh, appearance, how the building look like. So these are the from designer's point, point of view very important issues and so I will you know, uh, sequence in that way. Okay, first picture is okay. <laughs> okay, first picture is how do you start? And we are uh, suggesting to remove this piece first. Uh, this house, this room, this uh, media, uh, and the six classrooms, and few uh, offices here. And you may need a uh, portable. I don't know. It's, uh, we have to discuss that further. So after you demolish that, next phase will be you build this blue color new construction. Uh, out here, three stories high, classroom wing, and uh, expanding uh, cafeteria now, and then uh, here is a tech area and expansion of the gymnasium. This is the second uh, sequence of this uh, uh, construction. Now, you build this, and you can see this existing building is all connected. So while you are constructing this, uh, uh, this building, uh, you can use building without much uh, disruption. So see, uh, so I think uh, the duration of uh, this new construction may, might be, I don't know, 16 or 18 months, but I think school can operate uh, without interruptions. And after this is completed and then student can move into this new area. And this is the last phase. Now, this is all fully occupied and we are planning to remove this portion of the uh, building, but I think we should keep these things during renovation of this existing. So use it as a swing space. So it's much easier to uh, do a phase renovation of this existing building. So uh, I think uh, final uh, comment about sequence, is how, as you can see, sequence is very simple, very clear, and shorter construction phase uh, time. And uh, operation of school is uh, very easy during construction. And uh, I think uh, it really, uh, uh, talking about a uh, very economic way to approach this additional renovation project. Now, second subject is site improvement. This is the site plan after uh, building is complete. So here is a new portion and here's a new portion. Now, new entrance is here. It's a new entrance is right from in, uh, entering your campus. So this has not only about 420 parking, but all uh, 20 uh, buses shown here. So this main entrance is a truly main entrance of bus and car. So there is no question about which one is the front of your school, which you don't have right now. And then uh, the back here, like uh, you use now, after our after school hour, uh, it's public interest here. And you have now service here, and service is now back here. That's where it belonged to, you know, sort of hidden behind the place. And we have created a, a border bed or central office, a new entrance from existing at the 1928 building. And we have created a loop road, you see that? Loop road. Mm -hmm. I mean, to creating loop road really easy to understand the campus. Right now, you, can, you, you cannot go around and, 
and see what's going on in Thai school. So I, I, we, and uh, none of the fields are touched. So I think uh, your site has improved a great deal. And I think we are showing about 660 cars. I don't know how many cars you have now, uh, but I believe uh, we have shown sufficient number of cars here. So this uh, model, uh, uh, well, we brought a model, and so uh, we, we thought it very difficult to see. So just you can see just uh, pictorially how the building look uh, new and so on in one direction, the other direction. You can see there's a courtyard between uh, new and uh, it's uh, 1926 buildings. Okay, third item is plan organization, how school is organized. Uh, the key point is it really has to be very clear, simple, uh, uh, easy to understand plan. You see, there's a dot line here. This portion is a new, and there is a uh, dot here is a new. Uh, new. But the, as a whole, it's truly integrated floor plan. Very simple uh, organization. Main entrance here, straight uh, main street, and uh, connect to the other public entrance from uh, this north side. And then massing wise, in the middle of the building, we have cafeteria and courtyard. On the right side is really classroom and administration all here. And then support facilities are all the other side. So it's very easy to understand clear, logical layout. Uh, let me take you uh, the school, uh, what functions are located where. When you come in here, this is a three stories high, wonderful skylight lighted uh, 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 main hall and administration right next to it. And then we do have a arcade, a bus drop off arcade. So administration right here, counselor's office here, and uh, you are asking uh, uh, cafe and amphitheater next to media. And uh, uh, here's a media, two stories high reading area. And opposite side of that, we place the uh, uh, special ed office and uh, it's uh, uh, four classrooms here. And health is located here. And we, we kept this uh, 2003 uh, building used as a uh, classroom house. So we call this house two, this is house one. So it has a very strong identity of, as a, a uh, House and we kept this uh, existing your uh, outdoor uh, uh, the team team room. They are still same entrance here. When you go further, you see a, a, a cafeteria. This is expanded, and this cafeteria is open to north, looking out to uh, your hill and trees, and then looking out to this wonderful courtyard. This courtyard is a very secured courtyard. It will have a, a low wall and the gate. And this will be wonderful outdoor uh, dining area and outside. See, this will be seen from not only really cafeteria, but uh, the media. Uh, you go further. This back here is the support area for kitchens and uh, 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 custodian and mechanical. And entrance services back here. It's a right place from the back side here. And when you go further here and uh, gym, small gym and uh, larger gym, uh, main gym we showed uh, expanded. And north of that, uh, we added this small piece because the auto and wood shop need very high ceiling uh, space. So this is a new construction. We can create wonderful high ceiling space for that. And this additional uh, tech areas all here within existing uh, place. And this side, we have a music, two music room, existing music room, renovated, and uh, auditorium uh, uh, will be uh, upgraded and renovated, and we will add a mezzanine to that. And this 
1928 building will house a uh, ground floor uh, alternate high school at the end and has its own interest here and is starting with uh, one ceramic uh, classroom. So I'm going to go upstairs. There, is, there are a number of stairs going up, main stairs here, and another stair here, and another exit stair located here. So this is the second floor. So you can see, uh, once you come up here, this uh, pair of uh, classrooms are very efficiently uh, uh, linked together uh, with uh, this uh, main corridor in the middle. So each house has uh, uh, nine classrooms and breakout area and teacher's uh, uh, room and all associated uh, function at spec is asking for. So we, and then going over that side, second floor of uh, this uh, 1928 building is all art class and we're creating a mezzanine and the elevator and uh, renovating uh, that uh, uh, weight room. Third floor, it's basically identical floor uh, of the uh, second floor, two houses, house uh, five, house six, and the uh, roof of this uh, uh, media, maybe a green uh, roof, or even you may want a greenhouse because it's uh, accessible from this floor. And top floor of this uh, uh, old building will be housed uh, by a central office with a own stair and own elevator. So uh, really a summary of this thing is it's really easy to understand, very logical, uh, and I think it's a very efficient layout. I think all the functions are right place relating to entrance and uh, each other. And so uh, I'm happy, very happy about the way it's laid out. Now, uh, for uh, uh, meeting educational aspect. Now, uh, as Richard said, we are adding only 123,000 square feet. That is only 36% of the gross square footage. Uh, so you have to have, you have to choose. Uh, so we decided Classroom is the most important uh, area for uh, school. So we decided to creating the classroom most uh, 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 close to the edge spec is, is the right choice. That's what we choose to do. So we, we have education. The classrooms where most students spend most of the time has uh, this wonderful all the organization and work together. So I think uh, I'm happy about uh, how we uh, decided to choose uh, the classroom as a major uh, improvement. OK, so how the building look? It's very personal things. <laughs> but uh, let me show you. Uh, uh, this is the, as you come in, main entrance. That's what you want to see. Three stories, high space, and uh, wood uh, truss. Uh, skylight, <coughs> sun come right down to the floor. And from here, you see there's a stair going up to the second and third floor. And uh, uh, the administration and the counselor's office is here. And next to it, uh, remember, floor plan and cafe and amphitheater. And behind this uh, place, there will be a two stories high, wonderful. Uh, uh, media reading room looking out to the courtyard. And uh, this side, the additional uh, office, uh, administration office. And upstairs, these are the teachers' uh, workspace. So I think it's a very lively, wonderful, inviting place. And I think you're spending a lot of money, and we really show uh, to the town people, you know, why this is spent and something you very proud of it. And you go further toward the cafeteria, this is what you see. Here's a, a main street, I talked about straight shot, and you see all the way down to the other end uh, of uh, a public entryway after school hour. 
right here you see uh, expanded cafeteria area and, uh, and uh, survey area is open survey. And this look out, this courtyard, and we create a small alcove where sitting area so students can sit and look out uh, and also go outside the courtyard. Uh, so I think this is not only cafeteria, this will be the central hub of your school. Students always gather here and use multiple purpose way. This is a exterior rendering, uh, how uh, a building might look. And you see, this is the classroom wing. And the bus drop off here, main entrance is right here. And courtyard, and this is 1928 building. And these are gable roof of a uh, uh, roof of uh, Main Street. Uh, this is the street level. When you come in, this is what you're going to see. It's a very uh, impressive three stories high, very large uh, building. And uh, you see a main entrance is very large brick opening and uh, gable roof above. And you, you cannot miss this main entrance. Everybody knows that's where it is. And arcaded uh, bus drop off and behind it, ad administrations. Uh, and, uh, the choice of material, uh, we uh, de decided maybe brick is the best because uh, uh, you have a brick 1928 buildings and maybe brick is much more uh, identifiable or friendlier in uh, Farmington. Uh, so we showed the brick and uh, this building. This side is uh, southwest, east, that side is southwest, so we introduced vertical and horizontal louver to control the sunlight uh, to coming into a classroom. It really uh, adds more of an interesting facade. This is a close up and, and you see the louvers and main entrance and so on. Now, uh, this is a concept stage and, and uh, but we gave a shot at the exterior uh, it's, a, it's a very personal thing. It, uh, I think we did not have opportunity to work with building committee or public, uh, what kind of uh, look you are looking for and so on. So we look forward very much, next step, at the schematic design, work together, come up with a mutually satisfactory uh, uh, the facade. Uh, and we already started that uh, uh, Work and uh, a very large scale model. We can't bring this model, but we brought small model. But uh, uh, we work like this and uh, make a large model and work on uh, all the details and changing the facade different way. So you can see this courtyard relationship with this in the large scale model. And this is even interior, how it look, and you will be able to see what the atrium look like and so on. With that, I think I'd like to turn over to Richard. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Tyson. Um, Time-wise, so... Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes, plenty of time. <laughs> okay, so um, similar to our first option, what we did is we prepared a number of um, pricing documents, which consisted of drawings, showing plans, sections, mm -hmm. elevations. We called out material, uh, and also we wrote uh, outline specifications describing all of the systems, all of the finishes, in order to give the cost estimator a basis upon which to do pricing. Um, and then he came back with a price. Okay, I guess I'm taller than Tyson is. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then we got, we, got a, we got a price back. I'm gonna give you a peek at that price, although CSG wants to walk you through the details and how they arrived at it, but I do want to show you this number. $138.1 million for our option two. Now this includes all of the soft costs and all of the line items that you see here, including alternates, uh, that line number four. Now those alternates include a photovoltaic system. It includes uh, some improvements to Route 4. We had conversations with uh, town officials about improvements that would be required on that route. It also includes an access or emergency route from the site. 
So um, those are options. We need further discussion about that. Uh, those options could obviously be reduced or they could be even grown as we develop the schematic design. But that's the basis of that total amount. Okay, so remember I showed you the 30 cents per uh, eligible do dollar. Uh, CSG will show you a cost estimate at the end of our presentation and they'll show you some reimbursable items or eligible items. That works out to be, I believe, approximately 29 cents as opposed to 30 cents because you're not going to get the 30 cents. There's all kinds of rules that you have to adhere to, but that's our best estimate. If I compare that to option one from last week, that was about 8 cents mm -hmm. per eligible dollar. Okay, so where does the money go? Just like I did last time, I showed you a chart that illustrated where all of the money was spent to satisfy your statement of needs. You can see um, where all those millions of dollars go. Now, in option one, in addressing the sprawl, which is the line here, we had zero because option one did not achieve uh, eliminating the sprawl. Here, we did actually were able to price it through a combination of additions and renovations and demolitions. There's a cost associated with that. Um, and the upgrades for mechanical systems and so on, code compliance, uh, roughly $52 million. Now, Another way to look at it is where is it spent physically on the building. And here you can see an allocation of monies to different areas. In the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a chart that shows so much for site work, so much for building, and so much for FF&E, which stands for furniture, fixtures, and equipment. That's a budget that derived by CSG. That's how the total of $138.1 million is done. Now, you'll notice here in this lower right-hand corner where the addition is, it's $53.2 million for that addition. But remember, that's a three-story building. So that should be able to explain why there's that much money allocated to that corner of the building. <coughs> we chose, as Taishu mentioned earlier, that the money really should be spent on the classroom, modern classrooms. That's really where you need to create flexible learning environments. Uh, we'll get into those details during schematic design. We've done this before, but we think that that's where the money really should be spent on this project. Okay, I'm gonna touch upon your score sheet. Again, it's my opinion. You can reject my opinion. You are individuals with your own view, but I'm gonna go through it quickly and give you what I think. So you're gonna fill out your sheet for the TSKP. This is like a, this is like a runoff, I guess. So, in the first category, which is the local, state, and federal requirements, we meet all the local, state, and federal requirements. We meet the NEASC uh, report, uh, and I believe all of these line items should be rated four on a scale of zero to four. Uh, the second item is programmatic needs, starting first with um, disruption during construction, and we're projecting a 27-month duration of construction, um, starting right after portable classrooms are built. Now, Taisu said we have to talk about that. We budgeted portable classrooms, temporary classrooms. There are other strategies you could take if you could give up space within the footprint. But we did include the cost of that. So as soon as portables are built, then 27 months of construction <coughs> follows, ending in just before school starts in 2024. Next line item is meets ed specs. It does meet the ed spec. In fact, your ed spec has a list of programmatic spaces that we need to provide. That total is 187,884. I'm reading this from an angle, but I think that's what it says. Option two, which is our plan, actually delivers a little bit more program area, but we satisfy it. We don't cut any space in this, uh, in this plan. Um, then the core building components, such as corridors, stairs, elevators, those kinds of sports spaces, mechanical rooms. Your ed spec targeted 60,000. We were able to actually achieve it for a little bit less. Uh, and if you go to the straight to the bottom line, your ed spec uh, was approximating 274,000 square feet would be required for the building. We are actually at 267,000 square feet, which is good. If you can build a building for a less square footage and still meet the program, you're building a very efficient building. Next is 
are we satisfying the cafeteria needs, the media center, performing arts spaces? Are we creating the kinds of spaces that you need for um, collaborative learning, new space for enhanced educational program? I assure you we are. And these photographs are taken from a similar project in which we delivered those kinds of features. So I think these should be scored before. Next is consolidation of space. Well, we have created very compact um, spaces. We've reduced the sprawl. We've improved the internal circulation. This diagram illustrates how those classroom clusters, those learning communities are nested together so there's a very efficient arrangement of space. And all of the other items on this list, such as robotics is included, um, the alternative high school program, central office, they're all included in this uh, program. Next is building systems. Well, we're completely removing all of your mechanical systems with new systems. And our mechanical engineers are here to answer any questions you might have, but as a reminder, your existing building has services and mechanical equipment everywhere. That's not the way to build a building. It's the way it has evolved over time. We understand that. The way to build a building is to centralize your services coming in, have a central location. It's the most efficient way to do a mechanical and heating and cooling system. And then the system would be allocated to different zones of the building, as you can see by this color diagram. We talked about a lot of things during the development of the design. Um, I did mention that we did have, do have in our price uh, photovoltaics, but we talked about a number of things, humidification and dehumidification, modular systems for heating and cooling, ice storage, um, energy recovering systems so that we, it's much more energy efficient, a chilled beam system, and a geothermal wells. So when we looked at all of those, we had to draw a line somewhere that line that you see here, everything above that line is included in this number, in the 138 million. The items down below are not included. Certainly we can talk about that during schematics should you want to uh, pursue some of those alternatives. But this gives you a little hint as to what the utility costs might be. I'm gonna go over here so I can see a little bit better. The current building utility costs are $328,000 per year. If we renovate as new this option, it would be $368,000 per year. But remember, this would be a fully air-conditioned building for 11 months of the year. That's how those numbers were derived for that 267,000 square foot building. So that's not much more. But if we renovate as new with the photovoltaic system, your utility costs could be reduced to $239,000 per year. And that number that is included in the $138 million price. Uh, next is site improvements. I think we have achieved much better site uh, traffic configuration. We haven't compromised any of the play fields. We've made everything ADA compliant, so I believe we should score four in these items. Um, benefits to the community. Now, you have uh, a number of spaces that you need to use by members of the public after hours. Right now, you have to go through educational spaces to get there. Using the design that Taisu is proposing with a configuration of a main corridor, a main circulation, he called it a main street, you can get to any of the community spaces quite easily and lock off the educational portions after hours. So that's a very good use of um, community spaces. Oh, shelter in place. Those systems are included as part of this uh, budget as well. And lastly, I, I do want to talk briefly about fit and feel for Farmington. So, um, quite a bit of discussion in our office about this. And very early in the design process, Taisu did a sketch, which you can see at the bottom of this screen. It shows the 1928 building sort of on the left side of that elevation study. On the right side, you see a new building, uh, which would be finished in 2024. And I thought this is a pretty good representation of Farmington, a respect for the tradition and your history, preserving that and building a state-of-the-art new facility. These are like two siblings 
in your collection of your family of buildings. On the left is the oldest sibling, and on the right would be the newest sibling, and they're about 100 years apart. Well, 96 years, but close <coughs> enough to be called 100 years apart. Something from the past and something that looks forward to the future. Hopefully, you agree. The end. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Why don't we do the uh, financial overview first, and then we'll open it up for questions at that point. Of course. Uh, good evening. I'm Roger LaFleur. I'm with CSG. Uh, normally, Chris Cycli would be here, but uh, he's at another meeting, and he'll be coming in a little bit later, probably do the second half of this. Thank you very much for a, a great presentation. Um, this pretty much, these numbers pretty much speak for themselves. Uh, as you can see, the architectural design fee is at $4,895,000, reduced to match project duration. So we just wanted to make sure that that matched the duration of the construction. Um, professional fees are at $3,000,000. Three hundred and fifty-five thousand, um, and you have construction cost at one hundred eleven plus million. Did I say thousand? I meant million. <laughs> <laughs> million here, million there. Uh, alternates at uh, five million five hundred eighty thousand, which uh, get rolled up in the end number if they're selected. Okay, so their alternate means that they still have to be chosen. Uh, furniture equipment and technology is a uh, uh, number that we basically put together ahead of time talking with uh, other school projects and seeing what the numbers are for those uh, items. And then you have uh, always we carry the 5% owner's contingency. Um, as he was talking earlier in this presentation, he talked in terms of uh, the reimbursable. Uh, and everybody's interested in that because that's the, that's the money you get from the state and the less money that the taxpayer has to come up with. So we're, uh, we carried uh, a number uh, for both uh, architectural firms for $2 million in ineligibles. Uh, we will drill down as we get further into this process and hone that number. It might be a little high, it might be a little low, we're not sure. But ineligibles basically go to the concept that the state doesn't reimburse for everything uh, uh, on a renovate as new or for new construction. Uh, they have certain rules and regulations that have to be met. And for example, if they do work on, on the entry to Monteith Road for the school, while it might have been an improvement and help the situation for traffic to the school, uh, the state doesn't pay for any work on, on Route 4, I believe it is there, yeah. So they would have to uh, allocate the amount that was uh, appropriated for that construction and it would be deemed ineligible. And there's a number of those items and we'll, we'll go through that as we go through this process. Um, so as it stands right now, you have a, uh, um, we consider it project eligible is, is for the renovate as new is 136 million, uh, and then the state share of reimbursement would come to approximately 40 million, and the town share would be 97 million. And I'm rounding. Uh, so the 11 percent retainage that they talk about uh, is the amount of money that the state holds back until the final audit has been concluded. So, any questions? Thank you. For this option, the tax impact to the average home assessed at $226,777 is $480.31 in year one. Costs will decrease by approximately $9.09 .09 per year over 20 years. So if um, the building committee has any questions for the architects on the design, uh, we'll open up the floor for about 10 minutes. I have a question. Uh, start off. Um, I, miss, I know that there's been a lot of uh, talk about interruption. I think a lot of people in town are really probably their main one of their main aspects that they're they're worried about is any kind of renovate to new. Is how you know? I know you talked about the staging, and I wonder if you could delve a little bit more into that uh, area of it. Let's see if um, you know the areas that gave you the most trouble and that you thought would, would give us the most trouble and and uh, you know I think a lot of times I'm looking at the music program because we obviously that auditorium how long are people going to be out 
how, you know, what are we going to do for that, that time period that these are going to be, you know, where are the kids going to go? That, I, I just struggle with that, and as, as, and as, as well as the, sport, uh, the sporting uh, areas. I know those are non-educational areas I'm talking about, somewhat, but, but yeah. uh, I want to it's, see if you can tell It's a complicated answer, unfortunately, and we, we, the way we normally do phasing is we sit down with the educators, the people who run the building, and we look at their class schedule, and we try to free up what kinds of spaces might be available. Uh, we budget for portable classrooms, for example, just to make sure that there is some swing space. <coughs> it's not easy. It's not easy to achieve. Um, and we talk about strategies such as second shift workers doing work um, after classes are done for the day. I mean, we did a project uh, that was a combination high school, middle school, and everything was done after class hours. I mean, there's a premium that you pay, but the, the, but the disruption was, was shortened. And it ended up being a lot of corridor work to get a lot of utilities into the corridors before they're distributed elsewhere in the building. Uh, and, but everything is buttoned up and cleaned up before classes begin the next morning. That's one possible strategy. Uh, and then there are summers. You do have to get as much done during the summers as possible. In our timeline, you'll see that we've allocated three summers. Those three summers are critical. Um, you pre-purchase material, you stage it onto the site, and you try to knock out like the gym or the band area or whatever to minimize the disruption during the academic year. It's a complicated answer, unfortunately. And I think during the next phase of the design, we should be able to give you more specific information. I will tell you it's rare um, for any district to have enough swing space to accommodate. This is not an unusual challenge. It's handled all the time. Well, I showed you uh, our plan on no side of the Right. That's going to be demolished, but we will keep it the swing space. That's a big, big Mm. So you can move, you know, music program, <coughs> the classroom over there, and so on. So I think we have a lot more flexibility than no more renovate like new uh, projects. After we already completed, we have more very much of the project. Yeah. If you were paying attention to the score sheet, mm -hmm. I did not give this a four. I know. <laughs> I gave it a three because there's a better way, to, so stay tuned for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you uh, just give a little more detail on the efficiencies that you found, seeing that you were able to actually save some space from the ad spec, doing a renovate as new, which typically it's the reverse. Mm -hmm. You always end up a little extra. Well, I think, uh, I think the estimate that was put together for the ed specs was a reasonable estimate. The challenge for any architect is how can you configure the geometry of the building to make it as efficient as possible, reduce the amount of circulation, for example, really create mechanical spaces that are smaller. Um, I can't point to any one thing. It's a consolidation of everything. And, but we, what we didn't skimp on is the program. We, we, we satisfied your program. Um, but I think the geometry that we developed uh, during the design is really what made it very efficient. I'm sorry, this is Michael. Johnny, if, if I can just add to it. I, I had uh, two undesirable tasks on this project. One, I had to champion option one in our office and make it as good as possible. <laughs> <laughs> two, I was asked to find a better renovate as new scheme as better than Taisu's. Taisu gave me his and said, can you beat it? And I could not beat it, okay? We went, I went methodically through the existing plan on what to keep and what to knock down and how best to add to it as efficiently as possible and I could not outperform Taisu's scheme. That layout, that main street, and then the stack of those learning communities going up, you can't beat it. Maybe, we'll see, but <laughs> I can <can't. laughs> Thank you. Uh, just the last quick question. I know the site stuff we went through very quickly, but 
Um, you do address the accessibility to the upper fields and to the press box? Yes, yes we do. Um, we, in the interest of time, we couldn't go through all the details. We had to, sorry, Darren. We couldn't, we couldn't show every, all the work that Darren had produced, and it was a lot of work. Uh, and he transmitted that information to the cost estimators. So yes, all of those accessibility routes are addressed in the cost. Okay. Last question. Uh, if we, I know that portable classrooms, it's been said that they're pretty expensive and they're built into the budget. Uh, do you know even just an estimate of how much time it would cost us if we didn't get the portable classrooms to the construction phase? Because 27 months is a time frame that's typically for new schools where we've heard renovators new mostly between 48 and 60 months. If you didn't have that swing space, how much time would it cost? Disruption, I would say. I, I don't believe we looked at that, but I'll ask Michael to weigh in as well. The portables aren't inevitable. The portables are there primarily to replace this 800 wing that comes down for that three-story addition to be built. Uh, you could, for instance, forego your auxiliary gym and outfit that for the 800 wing. So that's not inevitable. And then uh, we did carry um, essentially eight classrooms worth of portables for the entire duration. So you can use them up front or you can use them on the back end. To Tai Su's point, the 500 wing, the 700 wing, that once the three-story wing opens, all of those kids vacate, you can swing whatever you want there. It, it's, not a, it's not a get out of jail free card, but we did what we thought was prudent from an estimate standpoint until we can really work out the details. The answer's in the middle. Thank you. I have a question. It relates a little bit to what Michael was talking about, having been in the unenviable spot of doing option one. Can you speak at all about uh, the variance that we would be seeing in your presentation that you offered last week by section of the building to section of the building this week? And the difference is you're know, just taking a quick scan of things. In the 1928 building, the maintain option supported about 5.3 million and now we're up to 12.5. Can you speak to what um, what what that delta is and, and um, Okay, I'm gonna have to defer to Michael on that okay. as well because he worked with the estimate <coughs> to try to allocate those costs. <laughs> so I, I just point out a few things here. Um, from the exterior, there's no difference replacement of windows, complete replacement of the failing facade, repointing, everything else, uh, complete reconstruction of the cupola, complete re-roofing. Um, from the interior, big change. First of all, the mechanical systems are no longer replacement in kind. It's all new um, systems, new distribution. Everything meets the state minimum, which is actually a high performance building standard. Okay, so it's not your minimum commercial standard, it's the minimum state standard for school construction. That's the biggest upswing, really, the delta there. Um, it's 30,000 square feet and you're paying, um, you're only growing by about seven million, so that's pretty good. The other thing is there's significant amount of repartitioning to adapt the third floor for the uh, central office space and to adapt the lower floors for both the alternative high school and the other pieces. Remember, we're restoring the original entrance to the 1928 building with this addition. And when you enter the 1928 building to visit the central office, you have a dedicated, new dedicated stairway, new dedicated elevator that takes you directly to the third floor. So there's no cross <coughs> circulation between the school populations, okay? So. More functional space and, and entirely yeah, and, and And to the public's update. credit, that's actually $7 million pretty well spent yeah. if you think about everything you get out of the 1928 building in this option. How about the, uh, the space in the auditorium and the, and the delta that would be there? Okay, again, there's very little delta here right. because you'll remember that we fully gutted the auditorium with all of our ad alternates in option one. And the uh, replacement in kind there, essentially, of the mechanical systems, all you're doing is you're upgrading that to the high performance units 
the distribution in the auditorium is much simpler. Uh, so it's, it's a modest upgrade for the auditorium, but you have to remember how much we focused on the auditorium in option one. That's a full programmatic upgrade, full acoustic upgrade, full the, uh, theater art system upgrade of that performance space. So really the only delta becomes the difference in the mechanic. The, um... Yeah, instead of putting in a Toyota unit, you're putting in a Lexus unit. Okay. And, and the difference in the, um, there, there's an the addition. The car brands you like. <laughs> <laughs> you're making an addition to the gymnasium uh, and there's a, there's a bigger delta there. I'm assuming that's the new construction on the outside of the building. It's, it's largely the new construction. Your EdSpec gymnasium is, we discussed this with the building committee. Um, the EdSpec gym, in, the gymnasium in the EdSpec has one thing. Uh, there is an aspect to the EdSpec desiring to fit the entire school population, and that actually drives the size of the, gymna the main gym up. So we went ahead and paid that penalty, and so the gym here exceeds the EdSpec in square footage, but I think in performance meets exactly what you need as far as capacity and court configuration. And then it looks like you've got about $4 million in new on the back end of the building, but there's $7 million that we, a little over $7 million that we wouldn't be uh, we'd be demoing from the previous plan. Uh, that four million on the back end, there's some residual uh, 400 wing in there that yeah. becomes culinary and okay. robotic space. It gets melted. But then um, we have right behind the new gymnasium sort of high base space for the wood shop the and good. automotive tech ed spaces. Thank you. Could you guys just give us a little more detail as well on the, the security uh, upgrades? I know looking at the building as it is, we, we have multiple entrances and exits, and, and how does that fit into this plan? Sure. Well, we are reducing the number of doors on the perimeter because we're demoing a portion of the building. But the difference, I'm trying to recall, uh, between the two. Well, it's, it's essentially, you have one main entrance. With the exception of the after hour entrance, which is maintained over between the auditorium and the gymnasium, you have one main entrance. Is that, that is your primary uh, security lock, and that will meet the current state standards for school security. Um, the fact of the matter is you will have additional exterior doors. You just can't get enough kids safely to egress out of the gymnasium without putting an exterior door. The point is with, that we would add both the sensors and technology so you get real-time readouts about the status of those doors and you could even consider removing the ingress hardware on those doors so they become purely egress only they've got sensors on them that go right back to the main office you can read it off your cell phone the status of however many doors you have there is one door to this school and that is you see it as you mount the hill from Monteith all the buses all the cars Everybody goes there. I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify what they do. They're, all the hazmat issues are then addressed through this. Yes. Yeah. Michael to Michael? Yeah. All the hazmats. Yep. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I, know, I, know I know you drilled our Michael about this <laughs> <laughs> and questioned the carpet over carpet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't question it. He offered it. <laughs> as, as, a, as a renovate is new, all yeah. that has, has to be addressed. We have to issue signed letters and testing to that. Good. On slide 13, you show the emergency accident behind the school and also the road going behind the softball field. Can you tell me if there will be another exit in that area for emergencies? I'm, I'm going to attempt. I don't think I can do this. Okay. Oh, it's a different slideshow. So um, in your mind's eye, uh, there is the loop road that is internal to the campus. Uh, we carve out space when we demolish the 500 wing to create a real emergency access road. Uh, that could be open to regular traffic if you wished. Um, there, is in the ad alternates about $200,000 of project cost to get an emergency only gate on the adjacent residential street similar to what we had 
This is next to uh, the town of Farmington City Grid. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the dead end street's name, but that would just simply have uh, a grade cut there and a, and a gate. Um, it's a good asset to have because if something happens on those fields, you can get um, an emergency vehicle out on those fields to address any issues. Thank you. I have a question. While we're on that slide, can you talk a little bit, I think this would be the slide, for pickup, drop-off, buses, kind of morning and afternoon, how that would work? You have to turn it on. Okay. Um, well, we can talk about this more, but the current condition is everybody uh, comes up Monteith, up the hill, past uh, between Town Hall and the library, and then um, it divides. Cars go this way and buses go back to here. In this scheme, everyone would stay on the same loop. Um, but the important distinction here is that we've created a significant queuing spot for the buses. So the buses can get in there and get out of everybody else's way while they unload and while they load. They're not sitting as they do now back here, clogging up the drive aisles. And in fact, they have a dedicated path in front of the school. Paralleling that is the vehicular parent drop off and pick up. Uh, all of it reconverges over here which is analogous to your current system and would simply have to be managed. This scheme includes all of the site improvements that we discussed with option one. So um, Monteith is widened to be four legitimate lanes plus a fortified shoulder to constitute an additional lane for emergency use. Um, this scheme and one of the ad alternates is about a half a, half a million dollar improvement to Route 4 to include legitimate right turn lanes coming out of Unionville and a legitimate left turn lane coming from the other direction and signal improvements. All of that has to be reviewed and approved by the state. Uh, everyone here understands why you would ask for it. Nevertheless, you don't always get what you ask for, but we've budgeted for it, okay? What this scheme does not include from last time is the shortcut road out of the library parking lot. Given that we swung all of the buses over to here and gave you full perimeter circulation around the building, we didn't feel that the cost of that grading and roadbed work was necessarily justified. Okay? We think you can address all of the circulation now on the east side of your building. You still have the west side that you can work with, but we've reorganized it to the east side. I have a question. I don't know if this is for Michael or Roger. Um, you had mentioned the ineligible costs. Roger had given a, uh, an estimate on ineligible costs. Was any any of the site work that you're talking about now, like the emergency exit, and even the site work around the building, how much of that is eligible in addition to um, any costs associated with the swing space? So uh, based on my experience on similar kinds of projects, anything that's within the site, site improvements, certainly all ADA improvements would be eligible traffic improvements for safety reasons would be eligible. Everything up to the property line in the emergency drive would be eligible. Once you get past the property line, then those parts would not be eligible. So those, I believe, were guesstimated or estimated by CSG and its estimators to be roughly $2 million. So everything that you see on the site, within the site boundaries, mm -hmm. would be eligible, in my opinion including the swing space, because it's a necessary part of construction. Um, ultimately, the state has the final call. Right. I have, in my past experience, seen swing space be eligible. So even like building out the auxiliary gym 
uh, the second gym for uh, classroom space, that's really up to the state to decide if it's eligible or not. If it's in your ed spec, right, and the state accepts the ed spec that you submit, it's eligible. Thank you. Can I just ask a question on uh, programming? So when I look at the auto shop, it appears that there's two rooms in the back. Is there outdoor access to that? Because it looks like it maybe butts up against parking. There would be outdoor access to it, yes. That's why we placed the, um, those shop areas on the back side of the building so that there would be site access to it from the opposite side. So staging of material coming and going, vehicles coming and going, whatever, um, could be done in that, in that paved area. Great. And can you uh, point me to where the school resource officer's office is on here? I just don't readily see it. It's, on, it, it's in the, um, the Purple Bay that's right on Main Street. Okay. On Tyson Thank you. Main Street. Boy, these are good questions. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, this is conceptual design. <laughs> we have a long way to go. But they're good questions. Okay. Sherry, do you have something else? No, or, no everything's okay. I think we're all set. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, we're actually going to just take a. Uh, oh, sorry. I took your applause away. <laughs> Uh, we're just going to take just a five-minute break. Um, just a few things, Rusty, before I turn it over to you. Just as a, a reminder to everybody, um, again, a lot of information being presented tonight, a lot of slides, a lot of thing, information that's, that's up there for you to view. Um, all that information, again, will be up and available on the website. Actually, some of it might be on its way right now uh, as we're working through the process. So please know that that's there. Um, if you have a very specific request meeting, um, you know, a, a paper presentation would be really helpful to you. Just let us know. We'll see if we can have some of those available uh, for pickup at uh, Town Hall. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, just let us know and we, we'll see if we can accommodate that request. Uh, but again, everything is available electronically and online for you to view. The, the entire presentation is there as well as all the presentations from last uh, week as well. All right, Rusty, you're all set? Okay, we'll turn it over. Good evening, my name is Rusty Malik. Uh, I'm with the firm Quisenberry Arcary Malik, and I'm a principal in the firm. I've been working for over 40 years, 30 plus years of my career has been specializing in educational architecture. We presented option one last week, and we're now going on to option two. And as you've all seen, option two is a very comprehensive solution to, this, to our project in Farmington. Some of the key differences really between option one and two are we, we're going to need to meet the full requirements of educational specifications. We need to minimize disruption to education. We need to look at safety and security in the building. And then a couple of other components, which is the sprawl. Everybody talked about the sprawl, and certainly you can't address that when you maintain an existing building. Two other interesting components. We are addressing the district central offices and also alternative education, which were not part of the original option. So just to orient everybody, you've got Route 4, Monteith Drive. So there's the, there's the parent drop-off right there. The buses are in the back, and here's Highwood. Just a big, big picture of the sprawling school that we call Farmington High School. So our charge, our challenge, was to take a building that's 218,000 square feet. It was built over 90 years in multiple phases. To take this building and to completely renovate it as if it was a new building, because that's what Renovate is New is all about, is to make it a new building. And in that process, expand it. Expand it by over 50,000 square feet, because that's what the educational program specifications call for. It's quite a challenge. And the key aspect of this is you do all this while the students are in school and you are trying to minimize disruption to education. <coughs> Quite a challenge. We had a lot of debate about what's the best approach? What are the priorities 
for us for this particular project? How do we address it in a way that really makes sense? Because these students have one ninth grade, one tenth grade. They're going to go through four years of high school, and that disruption is going to be significant to these kids. You know, my kids went through here to the school. They didn't have to deal with that. But the bottom line is. The students who are going to be attending the school, when this renovation project, if this was the option to be, uh, that was selected, they're going to go through some disruption. So we started thinking about it, and that really brought us to the point that what's the most critical component of this, of this project? Disruption to education. We have to come up with a way to minimize disruption to education. And if we're unable to do that, if we're putting additions and renovations and displacing uh, students from one place to the other, which the maintained scheme would have done, for instance, we would have moved students from one space to another, into a swing space, back out into a new space, very complex. So we had to come up with an option that said, how do we minimize this? Well, what this diagram is really showing is one way of approaching it is to build a new academic building on the back of the high school. Once you build that, and this academic building would include all learning communities, it would include art, and it would include mu music. Once you build that, the rest of the building now is available to you to do whatever you want. And what I, what I mean by that is now you, all the students, one time, move out of the existing classrooms into the new addition. It's a three-story addition in the back of the school then you start methodically renovating the rest of the building. And that's the way to approach it. Minimize disruption. A key component to any renovation project that's phased is what happens to your mechanical systems. We've got mechanical systems all over this building. With this approach, you start with a brand new boiler room in the new addition, and from that point on, that system extends out. So as you renovate a space, you basically then renovate that space, you extend the uh, mechanical systems. That's where you spend most of your money. We looked at alternate, you know, we, we talked about uh, swing space in terms of bringing portables in, using the gym. <clears throat> Ultimately, what ends up happening, you put money into swing space. I'd rather put the money into the school. So that, that's, that was our big picture approach to this. So here you, you see an image of what could happen. There's a three-story academic wing in the back of the building. It extends out for art and career technology. On this side is, is music and theater, and then you renovate the auditorium. Big picture. Once that work is done, that's phase one. Essentially, the students are not disrupted at all when this phase one is happening because for that first 14 months when this construction is, this is under construction, everybody is approaching the site from the front of the building. Everybody is coming to the school off Monteith Drive, and we're going to bring the construction group in off of off the access road that we're creating. So just to give you an idea, here it is. So here's the footprint of the new high school. This, is, this would be the revised parking lot. But while this section right here is being constructed, you notice how we, we talked about the, the access drive? But that access drive really functions as the construction entrance. So one of the key components of any renovation project is you separate construction, the contractors and the construction work from the students. This approach accomplishes that. You're constructing back here, the students are up here. So let's talk about the site a little bit. A few things that we needed to, to really look at on the site. One, there's a lack of parking. And so we address that. What you'll notice is that this building has a dress sprawl because the existing building comes out to somewhere around there. And we'll, we'll demonstrate, that, demonstrate that further. <clears throat> but by, by positioning, repositioning this building, we've created a much larger space in the front of the building and so when the main entrance, which will now be right there, and for those of you who were here when the main entrance was right at the, at the circular drive, uh, that's where the main entrance will continue to be. Uh, so that's the main entrance right there. All the parking is in the front, and everybody enters the building from one point. 
whether it's community, whether it's students. At the same time, we're addressing the separation of the bus drop-off and pick-up and the parent drop-off and pick-up. We don't believe that putting them in the same location is a, is a wise decision. <clears throat> and so what we've done here is the buses come in, they go to the back, we've reconfigured the, the drive in the back so the buses don't come angle in because there's always a question of safety when they're angling and then they're moving back out. So this way the buses are lined up, there's access points to the, for the students to get into the school, the buses line up here and then they leave. Nobody else comes in here. No parents. There's a small parking lot in the back that'll be dedicated to service. All parking is in the front and parent drop-off is in the front. Complete separation of those two circulation paths. We also accomplish emergency access around the building by, by uh, using this approach. Again, the site is fully made, made fully accessible. We're looking at geothermal well fields on the, high, uh, <clears throat> on the plateau up there with the fields and certainly improving the circulation of the parking lot and really establishing it in a way that, that the, the parking doesn't cross over parent drop off. So now let's look at, actually I'm gonna go back here. I mentioned how this is the, the entrance to the building. So there's a little plaza up front. So instead of a circular, a circular drive there, that'll now be converted into a plaza. So one walks into the building from that, off the parking lot into the plaza. And there's the main entrance. And that's just a rendition of what it could look like. Very simple structure. What you're noticing is there's a new gymnasium in the front right there. Administration would be right there. You come into the building from the main entrance. And one thing I should point out, <clears throat> we, we do have a separate entrance for Board of Education for the district offices off to, to the left of this image. So let's talk about the plan. You come into the building, the administrative offices have direct sight lines to anybody coming into the building. You come through a secure corridor, a secure vestibule, into the lobby space. Once you're in the lobby, now you're really in what I would call the public space of this building. And I want to point out that this is very close to where, as I said, this, the main office is currently. So if you look at this space, which is defined by all these public use spaces, it's a very defined space, it's very small, it's very controlled. That's what we want to achieve. We don't want people to be parking in the back there and trying to walk, because the, the natural tendency is to pack in the back, pack in the, back of the, uh, the, the school and then come to the, uh, to the auditorium and the, and the gymnasium. Or you're parking in the front here and walking a long ways. The distance from this lobby to that auditorium is about 250 feet. So we've, we've really addressed this issue of sprawl. The other thing is, as I said, all the public spaces are right off this, co this, this, uh, this lobby area, which is really extending into the commons, the student commons, which is also referred to as the cafeteria. So very compact, and let me just walk you through some of these spaces. So as soon as you enter, now this is the, the main entrance right here, enter into the lobby, to the left is the auditorium a pre function space for the, uh, for the auditorium, I'm sorry, the gymnasium, and therefore it's really an extension of the, uh, the lobby itself. What you'll notice is we introduced some skylights uh, so that we brought natural light throughout this building. All the materials are durable materials. We want this space to really function well. You're in the, in, in the gymnasium, uh, which is a new space built the, the head spec standard, so it's a brand new space in the front of the building. Now, what you'll notice in the plan that the locker rooms and the gymnasium are in the front of the building, so you're not going all the way to the back of the school to get to the main gym. It's right there. And the locker rooms are directly accessible to the fields. When you come back out, this is now a view from the main entrance down what we call Main Street as well. Uh, and Main Street here, is, if you all recall, <coughs> this is the auxiliary gym. Really on this side is the music program. By taking the approach of 
building a new music program, new academic spaces, we're now able to repurpose the existing mu music program, the band room and the chorus room, into what we call the, the student commons or the cafeteria. And that space that, that has some natural height, height in, in, in the space, the structure is high. We're able to reconfigure it so that it really is well lit, it's inviting, it's inspiring. Students come in there and are able to, to, to really work in that space. But it's really the main hub of the entire school. This is just another view as you're walking down the hallway. We put some skylights in. Actually, it was interesting because as we were developing this model, uh, we put these skylights in place and we look, and this model is designed to, to, to reflect the ex existing building. And you look up and you see the cupola through the skylights in, in the commons area. So it's a little bit, bit of uh, new space, new, new design connecting to the original building. As you can see, lots of natural light. Uh, the first level of the 1928 building is where the kitchen and surgery would function. So the service comes in from that, from that side, and that whole space opens right up. As we're standing in that hallway looking down, now what we're viewing is the auditorium on the left side right there, and what would be the new media center. So in this particular option, we did something different. We repurposed the the, and reimagine the auditorium space where it is. But we took the existing gymnasium and said, really, that's the heart of the building. And what do we want to put in the heart of the building? We want to put the media center because that's the, the, you know, the, what it's all about. It's about the learning commons. So we have the student commons and you have the learning commons. And that learning commons has to be proximate to for public use, but also for all the educational spaces. So as you come into that, and this is a view looking from the, that lobby, the pre-function space of the auditorium back towards the cafeteria. But to the left is the media center or learning commons, and to the right is the auditorium. Again, working within the existing building, repurposing spaces, using your imagination to really create inviting spaces where students can be inspired in, as, they, as they come through the school year. This image is really uh, washed out. But uh, this is just an image of the, the media center. Because it's the, it's the gymnasium, it's a high volume space, so we're able to do, you know, create natural light. We've actually, which if you'll notice, in the back, that wall it, it has been modified, so there's natural light coming in. The new addition is in the back of the media center, which will be the media center, and to the left of, the, of this space. So there's a nice courtyard out there. So natural light coming in. A nice courtyard so one can go, it can be a reading courtyard. There's a lot of spaces in, in this building now that are going to be very different. Just another view of the media center. <clears throat> but, but the key here is it's an informal space. It's a space where students go for creative activity. Uh, there's maker spaces in there. There's a, a, an amphitheater in there. Those are all program elements that are called for in the educational specifications. And we've met every one of them. Across from the media center is the auditorium, a two-story space that'll have 725 seats. Um, fully accessible, brand new space, as I said, reimagined with a mezzanine out, fully accessible on the inside. <coughs> Just a little further down from the, uh, from the auditorium is the theater arts program. Now, there's some question about the theater arts, whether that's a public space versus a student space, but in my experience, it's like a black box theater. So it's used by the public as well. It's really a, sh a small venue for theatrical production or for any production. Once again, it's right off Main Street, right in the public domain, and certainly can be used by everybody. So let me just walk you through one very quickly. You've come in the lobby. We've looked in the gym. This is the cafeteria commons with the survey. That's the 1928 building. I mentioned very early on that the Board of Education had its own entrance, and that's the entrance right there. That brings you into the building. This is the elevator. That takes you up to the second floor where the Board of Education district offices would be. The auditorium, the auxiliary gym, and the library media center. And this space right here 
is the, the black box theater or the, of the, the theater program space. Now what you look at, what you'll see, is the academic zone of the building, right in the back right there. So here's what you see, is the music program, brand new, all new spaces. So they're, they're, uh, they've been designed to meet all the criteria for music. The learning communities are in the back. This is a three-story addition. Just want to clarify, where the music, and, and on the far end, which is the book, end of the book ending the, uh, the learning communities, is the art and technology and career science. So these two spaces are single story spaces, and then the learning communities are three story. You know, some of the, the, the spaces that are defined in, in the educational program really talk a lot about collaboration. They talk about how do we make this a flexible space because program changes, educational programs change every year. And we need to provide this and make this a school for the future. So we had to look at this design that allowed us to really create spaces that were flexible, that were collaborative, that allowed students to, to participate in teams. It gives you a, a learning community, but it can also be used in, in other ways as well. So if you wanted to, go, if you were to change your whole approach and say we're going to go back to be departmental, you could still do that. You know, so there's a lot of variations and options with this space. As we go up to the second floor, and I, and I should say, really, as we look at it, a learning community for those who are questioning, well, what is a learning community? Well, it's a multidisciplinary classroom, <coughs> a, a multidisciplinary <coughs> space, a cluster of rooms that really is, is a combination of classrooms, science labs, uh, breakout rooms, small group instruction. So it's a variety of spaces that create a learning community. And, and that's what we've defined right here. So what you'll see is on the first floor, we had uh, learning community one and two. On the second floor uh, th is learning community three and four. Very compact. The ability to, to be able to get to any of the, uh, of the specials is, is very sim it's simplified. The design is, is such that, uh, again, we were able to get a lot out of the space. And we introduced a lot of things such as you know, partitions that allow you to open up classrooms from yeah, 700 square, square foot classrooms to 1,400 square foot classrooms. So there's a lot of uh, uh, options here in terms of how the building itself can be configured. For instance, right here is the, the breakout room and this, and a small group instruction space right across it. One of the things we said is, what if we open those up so that they can be classrooms, they can be closed off, but then you can use the open the folding partitions and create a much larger space. And that's, that's, those, that's the type of thinking that we thought will we'll really when we look at this, uh, with, at this design, that's what's going to make the space more inviting for students. You'll also notice that we've got the auditorium and the mezzanine level, but on the second floor, we have alternative ed and we have board of education. There's access control to both of them, but you'll also see that these are some of the skylights we're talking about that bring natural light to the center of the building. Because when you make a building compact, you're going to have interior spaces. Now, none of the learning spaces are windowless, but these interior common spaces and lobbies can use natural light through skylights. Here's a, a, an image of what the, the breakout room and the small group instruction space could look like as it opens up. So one large open space, or you, sh you close the folding partition, and now you have smaller spaces. Or science lab rooms are labs, combination lab classrooms, an example of, of a science lab room. The third floor, again, it's a, it's a, rep, a repetition, a replica, replica of the second floor. You've got the two learning communities. One thing what we discovered is as we used the 1928 building there's a defined square footage for the Board of Education District offices. That's around 9,500 square feet. From my experience, and I've designed many Board of Education facilities, that's really pretty minimal. Uh, the, the space for a school district our size it needs to be at least 12,000 square feet. But the reality is this design uses the 1928 building for those functions. And what you have here is space that the Board of Ed 
as the need arises, can expand into. So we're not using the entire building. We're able to make, come up with a design that gives us some future use space. In general, one thinks, oh, you know, we're going to cut sprawl, but we've just added over 50,000 square feet to the building, the existing building. So when we looked at what does this do to our footprint, what we discovered is we actually still, with the, with the addition of this additional square foot, we're 13,000 square feet less than, than the existing footprint. But the, the key here is, you know, 300 feet right there, very compact, allows students access to all parts of this building. But to me, the, the, the best part of the solution is how it's phased, how it's constructed with minimal disruption. And that was our number one priority. So at this point, I'm going to turn it to, over to Angela Kale. She's the project manager. Well, thank you, Rusty. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, Rusty described very thoroughly the design, so we're going to we'll move along quickly with the next slides. Um, you can see here again another overall of the design, our option two design. Uh, we took all these options on as a challenge and tried to meet them all individually as fully as we could, um, and we're very proud of all of them. Um, so again, you can see the uh, three-story addition in the back. You can see the entrance plaza. You can see the potential for solar PVs on our new roof of the new gymnasium and uh, locker room and support areas. And you can see the prominence of the 1928 building. I recall in one of the executive sessions, uh, the committee members asking, well, what's this three-story addition going to do to the 1928 building? How's it going to affect it? And in our mind, you know, the 1928 still needs to be the prominent feature in this scheme. Um, and we'll have some other views that, that sort of show that. Uh, the next view, sorry, thank you. <laughs> the next view, again, shows the two entrances, uh, the main entrance with the higher canopy for the school and then secondary for the Board of Ed. We can go quickly through this. This is the back side where Bu Rusty mentioned the bus drop off coming up through, uh, looping through the building and uh, the kids securely getting immediately into their classroom spaces off the bus and also in the afternoon coming immediately out of their uh, learning communities into the bus. Um, and then here's another slide of the back area. Those are the locker rooms that are off of the new gym that immediately adjacent to the fields. Um, so it was a lot about adjacency here and then uh, that in the back. So criteria, we don't have too much time to go through the criteria, but we're going to spend just a, a quick minute on each of them um, and point out the important parts. Again, similar to last week, you'll see the criteria number at the top of your slide. We'll be handing this out right afterwards and all the subcategories right, um, right underneath. So, uh, you know, Rusty pointed out, the, the green area is the public circulation area. Uh, you'll see those little uh, circles like we did last week. Those are the lock-offs between where the public really goes and then where the academic area where the students go. So what we really wanted to achieve here was that public to private separation. And that's what this slide exemplifies. It also enumerates the reduced number of exterior access doors around the perimeter of the building. Again, very carefully uh, being, you know, conscious of all the security needs, not only within the building, but with the site. By putting the academic addition in the back, we're keeping the kids in the most secure area. They're in those learning communities the majority of the time. We, we want to keep them away from the front entrance. Next. Um, so phasing. Rusty talked a lot about phasing. I think you understand it. We're going to build uh, that L-shaped <coughs> academic addition first. That's the first phase. We move all the kids uh, in, you know, into that space. Then we start doing renovation. The three phases are, are defined on the bottom. That first phase is 14 months. Phase two is eight months. Um, and Just a quick comment. Yep, what you'll see is by in phase two, we're renovating the cafeteria. But the existing cafeteria continues to function. So there's no disruption to food service in this approach. So again, that first 14 months, really no disruption to students at all. That's all getting built. This next two phases, 8 and 14, there is a little bit of swing. Um, but So really, the overall disruption that you'll feel in this option would be closer to 20 months. Um, so phase 3 is, four, is the 14 months, again, building out those new spaces in green, um, and then finally going back and demoing, demoing that uh, space. Um, the other thing you'll uh, notice um, in the design is that reduced uh, footprint that Rusty was talking about, really making this plan as compact as possible, which also helps out um, increase the usability and safety and security of the site layout. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Steve Krasinski, our mechanical engineer from Van Zelm right here in Farmington. Thank you. Um, I'm 
going to do this short because I think I'm already getting the hook here. Um, <laughs> essentially, all the mechanical logical systems are going to be new in the building. Um, there was a number of key factors that we were looking at to accomplish. Um, and I think everyone sitting in this room is probably hot right now and a little stuffy. And that's a couple of the things that we really want to address, thermal comfort, energy efficiency. Um, and the system that we're proposing is a 100% outside air system. So we're bringing in treated outside air, and then we're exhausting all the air. We're not going to recirculate it within the building. And that should deal with temperature comfort and stuffiness and so forth, and air quality. Um, the other components of this is that they're very energy efficient. Um, as mentioned, we basically start out by looking at at least three different systems and all of increasing efficiency. And working with the committee, we'll finally decide on a system. Um, and so once again, we deal with very sustainable systems, energy efficient, very easy to maintain. And how we design the system ensures that all the items that need to be maintained are located in the corridors, not in the classrooms, so that if during the course of a day something happens, you don't have maintenance staff in a occupied classroom. You can just deal with it in the corridors. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, did you? <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> no, we're, okay. we're gonna kick him out because nobody wants to listen to engineers, but. Um, <laughs> I'm Dave Quisenberry, pr founding principal of the firm, and uh, can you change the slide? So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm fighting a cold here, but I still wanted to speak to you all. Um, so we, we dress in our design portion, the site improvements here are in the criteria slide. I'm reiterating the improvements we have by losing that massive chunk of the building. Um, to the right of this slide, you see that we were able to create a much, much larger parking lot there. We've increased the parking. Not only we increased it, but we've concentrated it in one location, separated the bus loops. Um, as you know, we discussed um, last week, and again, the improvements to Monteith Drive and the intersection at Route 4. And then our scheme also includes this little wagging tail there, which connects the, the, the school down to um, Highwood Road. Um, that's, as Rusty mentioned, that's important in this scheme as a construction entrance while we're building that first piece of the project and then long term as a safety <coughs> element to, to be there. Um, as far as benefits to the community, as we've discussed, that's, that has to do with the fact that we're renovating this building for the benefit of everybody, not just the students. And so it's very important that when you do a project like this, if you expect a successful render referendum, you have to do things that, that everybody benefits from. So the, all of the um, common areas of the school are renovated and all of the common areas of the school are all accessible off of this nice um, common area, lobby, high quality um, public space. So it just works very well. And then obviously, um, you know, if this becomes a shelter, if we have another crazy October snowstorm or something like that, we can basically this this facility can function in a way that will become a place that people can can uh, um, shelter themselves from the storm. As far as the fit and feel of Farmington, obviously as a renovation, we're not reinventing the wheel here. So we're working with the palette of existing materials that are already on the site. So again, <coughs> it's the brick, it's the um, kind of limestone uh, materials that are basically we're put here 100 years ago, and we're working with those. Um, again, we respected the fact, we tried to put our addition to the rear so that it would not dominate the original building. And if, you know, this image shows it, but if you, all of you know that when you're driving down Route 4 and you look up at the building, pretty much everything to the left of the original 1928 building is hidden behind the trees. So realistically, when we're done here, you're gonna see the 1928 building you're going to see the, original, the existing auditorium. All of our addition is actually not going to be visible from Route 4. Um, as far as inside the school, I'm going to have Eric, an interior designer that works at my firm, discuss some of the materials and how we're going to address the interior of the school. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> uh, 
I'm Erica Roberts, I'm your interior designer. And as you can see from the last renderings that we had up on the slides, you can really get a feel for what the interior finishes could be and what our design concept is. And we also have the finish boards up front here, so please, after, come take a look, come feel, come touch all the finishes. Um, but I'll get it, I won't get into every single one, but I'll give you a good overview. Uh, so last week's interior scheme, it really got into uh, the existing building and really making a cohesive space uh, with the existing building and with some new finishes. Uh, with, with the Renovate's new scheme, we really focused on expanding that same color scheme and really taking the low maintenance, durable finishes and really making it an inviting space. And we really focused on lasting but also cost effective finishes for the space to really give a timeless approach to the building. And you'll also see from the past renderings that we had up on the slides, we also put some pops of colors within the space, really because we want this building to stand the test of time and really have a cohesive space with, again, timeless finishes. Um, and we believe this concept achieves a sophisticated collegiate approach to the building and environment. And I'll turn it back over to Dave. Thank you. Lower it down to normal height. Um, so again, uh, as we go through the criteria slides, um, this is essentially a repeat from last week. Um, we discussed the alternates. I mentioned when I was talking about site improvements that the access drives are listed as alternates. These alternates are included in our prices, um, but they are not necessary for the success of this project. They're just things that we're well aware of from personal experience and also from talking to people within the community that these improvements would be very good for the project. Um, here's an example of, the, of that, those improvements to the roadway. And one of the things I want to point out at the bottom section is if you walk through the woods where that little access road is proposed, you'll realize it, it goes relatively level and then it really drops off. And so you initially scratch your head and you say, how in the world am I ever going to actually connect down to that roadway, um, but we did we did the full um, engineering analysis on it, and it works. It does work. That's why we've got some of the um, swerves in there is to get the grade. It's it's an acceptable grade. It's actually less grade than Monteith Drive, and then one of the things that we hope works is that if you see because it's actually set down in a valley there, is that the homes that are in that that little street that's between this point and Route 4 that, that any vehicle traffic that would actually use this new roadway would be kind of over the hill and not like driving through their backyard. Um, so that was kind of an important aspect of this as well. Excuse me. So again, to, um, to reinforce the, the issues with this scheme, the, the real key was that whole minimization of, of disruption by building that academic wing in the back. We were able to make the scheme amazingly compact. And a lot of what you have to look at when you look at a scheme, I know, I know the disruption is hard, but look at it after the project is done. And, and this school is in the location it is on the site because this is a good location for the school. And uh, we'd like to just snap our fingers and end up with a new school right here where it is. We can't get there, um, but this scheme gets us, you know, when the project is done, we, we get ourselves with a, a pretty nice school that's in a very good location on the site that functions and, and continues to work with our existing athletic facilities and all of that. Um, and obviously it meets all the needs of, of, that we were late, set out to meet. So um, basically that kind of concludes our presentation for this, and we'll move on to the cost um, elements of it, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. That was a fun presentation. Um, same as uh, prior, the, you're going to see these numbers are pretty self-explanatory. The architectural fee uh, is dedicated to this firm um, and is, again, reduced to match the duration of the project. 
uh, professional fees are three million three hundred fifty-five thousand. Uh, the construction cost at this point uh, is one hundred eighteen million, uh, with alternates at one point four nine three million. Um, we kept the same numbers for furniture, equipment, and the technology, and five percent owner's contingency. What I also wanted to mention was that uh, the exercise that we went through when we were evaluating the budgets uh, was really a combination of, it's really a peer review. We had a, a third party independent uh, uh, estimator who does quite a bit of school construction estimating and worked closely with the uh, estimators for both firms and they reconciled and got to the numbers. So at this stage for where we're at in a concept, we're feeling pretty comfortable with the numbers that are putting out there. Of course, details as they emerge, as this design goes into the next phase, uh, uh, once it's selected, it'll get honed in tighter and tighter and numbers will start to shift a little bit. But right now, for this stage, we're feeling pretty comfortable with these numbers. Um, so as Roger said, this one came in at 140,597,857. Uh, state reimbursement estimated at um, just over 41 million for a total of uh, for the net project cost of 99 million, uh, just a little over that. Uh, for this option, the tax impact to the average home assessed at 226,777 is $488.70 in year one, and costs will decrease by approximately $9.09 .09 per year over 20 years. So again, we'll open this up to the committee for questions for the architects. Quick uh, question. Um, I was meant to ask the other architects as well, but I, I was curious to what, if you had a breakdown to the demolition costs versus. So we didn't, we have that information on the the, the estimate, but we don't have that uh, information. But what, what, I sh what I can tell you this is in this particular option, uh, the hazmat cost and the demolition cost were actually slightly lower than the, I should say the hazmat cost was lower than the option one, the maintain option. Because the, the, when you demo a part of the building, you don't have to go back and test the, the material. You just demo it as a whole as hazmat. And so by doing so, the, the cost of hazmat remediation totally eliminates the use of uh, the need for a hazmat monitoring, which is a significant part of that uh, of that cost, so the hazmat cost actually came down in this option. Uh, one other question: um, I know if I did if I did my math correctly, I did it kind of quickly. You were doing an overall uh, duration somewhere around 36 months. Is that is that correct? Some, some somewhere between 34 and 38 months. Yes. Okay. Uh, just, I know the curious that they, the first group had it in at 27 months, which is, I find that interesting, but I wanted to know if you had any uh, Yeah, we did a very, it. very detailed analysis of our constructability and, and had a third party review it with us. Now, we spent many hours with our engineers looking at how the mechanical systems would function, how you maintain the existing building while the new building is built. I think we came up with a very efficient scheme so that that entire new building uh, will be supplied with a new boiler room, which, which once that's complete, will then that, that will extend out to the, the renovated portions of the building. And typically what you do is while you're building that, any connection points that are going to, will be going to the future uh, renovation or additions are already brought to those locations. So then when you start renovating, those parts of the building, the connections are all there. We'll have a centralized boiler plant that will be in phase one. And as we renovate other parts of the building, those four or five other boiler plants that we have in this building will just be decommissioned as we renovate parts of the building and those buildings, that building is not used. Now we did give ourselves a lot of flexibility. Uh, we could have taken a more aggressive approach and said, you know what, We're, we've, we've got all this educational space left over. Uh, we can aggressively demo that, but at this point, we wanted to be very conservative about it. We think that 
our, our schedule is very aggressive, um, and yet it's very simple, simple in the sense that there's really large components that are being renovated at any one time. So there's efficiency there. I, I'm, I'm not privy to how they came up with the, their schedule, but our schedule was based on timelines that we discussed with a construction team as well as with our engineers. Thank you. <coughs> Rusty, um, question on the, on the slide that has the 58% of original building, the previous presentation at 66, is there a cutoff or a standard from the state that talks about renovate as new and how it qualifies? What percentage needs to remain or be um, renovated versus new? So our experience is that there are some requirements in terms of the, but that's a, that's not a, that's a fine line. It, it really is a function of how and what's happening in the building. In other words, they don't want you keeping a part of a building if it, just to, to meet that, that sort of the, the number that's been provided, the state looks at it holistically. So we've had buildings that we've kept 70% of the building, and we've had buildings that we've kept 40% to 50% of the building, and, and been able to achieve renovation status. So it's really a function of how, when you sit down with the state and you dis, d discuss the approach, what makes sense, does, is it reasonable? I mean, there are other parts of this building that we think we can keep, but there's, there's really very little logic to keeping them because you're just trying to keep a, a, a part of a building that doesn't function as a whole with the, the organization of that building. So that would be a discussion. Okay. And then, because uh, the slide, it went quickly, but the square footage of new building, if I'm seeing it correctly, is 266.5, which is basically identical to the last one square footage but you have another 8,000 for future use. What gets, it, it gets, that 8,000 gets completely remediated? That's correct. And, is, and in what state is that left when it's done? So we left it in actually keeping the existing partitions, but fully remediated and reconfigured to back to that. So finished, finished out. But it, you know, it would be a fun, it would be a discussion as we moved forward with the design, if the schematic design went through. I'm sure there's, creative ways that we can address the need of some of those spaces. As I said earlier on, I noticed some things that were not identified in the Board of Education or the district office space that are very typical to Board of Ed spaces. Uh, so those spaces can very easily, and that cost is already factored into this, in, into this estimate. So we, we treated it as if it was going to be renovated. Uh, but th the reality is that's really not part of the program. It's an important distinction because Board of Education spaces don't have space standards. Schools have space standards, and we're within our space standards for this, the, the educational portion of the building. But the Board of Ed uh, doesn't have that space standard, so you can, if you can demonstrate the need for it, you can renovate that space uh, and make it fully eligible for reimbursement. Okay, and just to be clear for the public, Board of Ed, meaning central offices. Central offices, the district offices, of that. that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, Rusty, with the bulk of the parking being on the uh, front entrance, how are you going to distinguish between faculty and student parking? So typically, that's an interesting question. <laughs> typically, that's something that's assigned by the school. What, what we see when you have the parking in, in, in one, one area, that there's zones that are developed that become student zones. Usually what we see is that the student zones are the furthest, so they have to walk the greatest distance to, to the school. The visitors have the closest to the school, and then the teachers and the staff is the next tier. So it's tiered, and that's very common in, in when you have a large parking area. I apologize if I missed it. So will it be a designated area? It can be, uh, yes, it's typically a designated area. In many cases, what happens is the school assigns the parking, and so there's, those are their parking numbers that are assigned to each student as they apply for their parking space. So it would be designated in that manner. And you want to keep it flexible from, day, from year to year, things change. question on any estimate that you made about the energy costs or what how they would compare to the the norm that we're experiencing now 
So, again, we are expanding the existing building. And we are um, making it more energy efficient because a large portion of this building, the building envelope, is, is brand new. New roof, new walls, insulated. Uh, our energy systems themselves are, are very efficient. Uh, we've looked at PVs, photovoltaics. We've looked at geothermal. Uh, so all that is, we have not done an actual calculation because it's on understanding that there will be a separate calculation done uh, for that purpose. Uh, but in general, uh, will our building be efficient? Yes, extremely efficient. I'm not sure if this is a question for, um, for Rusty or for CSG. I'll ask it and then we can decide if it's now or later. Uh, when you look at these two particular plans, do you see one spending resources in, uh, more heavily in one area versus the other? And, and how can we discern in, in this particular design where, where resource dollars are going to? Um, the quick answer is no. Um, I think what we have to do is we've seen this for the first time as well. So I think we have to do is sit down with the plans, go through them page by page, and kind of analyze their approaches and try to understand where they found the efficiencies and, in fact, did they really uh, generate dollars or savings for that? Was it worth it? And But that's a, that's a longer-term analysis. We'll have to sit down with the team and look at that. Um, maybe um, not in the context of how are we saving energy, but more in a sense of how are we spending money on this project? Uh, where where are dollars going in the overall 140 million, as compared to perhaps the other uh, project? Yeah, same thing. Same I thing. To, okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, we can't do it from base yeah. on just this. Okay. If you want to answer this. No. Uh, again, in order to do that, the estimator would have to break it out yeah. by space. We would have to designate to them, give us a separate cost. And the estimator is fairly challenged in trying to get even the estimates to us in such short notice that he's doing two very large scale estimates in a very short period of time. Um, so, you know, we, we work with the estimator. It's a, it's a tough task for them, but it's certainly something that can be provided. Uh, we can assign values to it, but I'd rather rely on this third party independent estimator. Any other questions from the committee at this time? Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Rusty. Uh, as, a, as a finishing note here, um, all the presentation material is on the web right now and available and accessible for everybody to review again in detail. Um, at this time, uh, I am actually going to make a motion with the committee to move into executive session because we are still in a competitive process. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Public comment. I was just stopped. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm getting way ahead of myself. Yeah, so uh, at this point, I apologize. At this point, I'm going to open it back up for public comment based on presentations, if anybody would like to speak. Good evening. My name is David Gordon. I've lived in the Highlands for 30 plus years. I have three sons who attended Farmington High School. I am a registered architect in the state of Connecticut, and I've been in this profession for 41 years. I worked at Yale University for nearly 20 years, and I've interviewed and hired all the architects and CMs and contractors during that 20 year period, renovating all of the residential colleges and all the new buildings you saw during that period. So I have a lot of experience in, in this area. 
When I first walked into the school last week and saw the condition, I thought the only thing that we could do was to build a new building. That was changed when I saw TSKP Partners design. I thought that was very innovative. I liked the fact that the classrooms were in the front of the building. Um, I liked that everybody, all students, whether they came by car or by bus, were dropped off at the front door. Um, in contrast, um, I looked at critically at what Quisenberry had drawn. And one of the things that I did not like is that they were separating students, cars in front, students in back, and coming in in buses. That's like creating a secondary entrance for the handicapped, um, which, as you know, they don't like. Um, and then, and you also then saw a huge sea of parking in the front of the building. The academic wing is now in the back instead of in the front. Um, I think security is a greater issue, putting it back there. It's the least secure area. The front of the building is the most secure. And those entering the front door now have to walk a long way to get to the classrooms. And it's not just the space inside, it's also the space outside. I also, uh, being in the Highlands, do not like the access road coming off of Highwood. Um, there are only basically two entrances into the Highlands, one off of Highwood, one off of Knollwood. Knollwood is become a problem with the new restaurant being constructed across the street. Trying to get in and out of Highwood is dip more difficult. <coughs> to add um, more traffic to that, whether it's construction traffic or emergency traffic, I think is problematic. Also, there have been many times in the last 30 plus years when all the entrances to the Highlands have been shut off and we can't get in there, how are the people gonna get out, even, even if it's emergencies? And I, and I would think, well, if it's just for uh, emergencies, uh, I don't think they'd be coming up through the Highlands as students would be. <clears throat> The other thing that, as I've been on many selection committees, and there have been hundreds, um, one of the things that we did not like in the very beginning, especially in interview processes, is, is putting up finish boards. They really have no purpose at this point in time. Um, They really have anything to do with anything concrete. At this stage in the process, they're just there to try and wow you and to show you um, nice, pretty colors. Um, but that's probably not what we are gonna get in the end. You don't even know what the spaces are yet. Um, so that's, I think, uh, what I have to say. Thank you. Any additional public comment at this time? Okay, all right, so I'm gonna repeat what I said a minute ago. Unfortunately, you'll have to hear it again. Uh, but, um, so at this point again, we are gonna move into executive session. Just to remind everybody, we are not coming out of the executive session room with any kind of recommendation at this point. We're gonna hear this third set of 
uh, presentations and um, go from there.